Welcome to EvolvedNest.org Explained. My name is Dr. Darsha Narvaez, and I'm here with John Geisiker, the director of Doctors Opposing Circumcision. Welcome, John. Hi, thank you, Darsha. I'm delighted to be here. Great. So uh, just a little bit about the evolved nest. Humans evolved to be nested, and humanity's nest for young children helps uh, children uh, develop in a thriving, resilient manner. So what does that uh, look like? Well, thriving includes physical health and happiness, self-confidence and self-acceptance, self-control, emotional intelligence, physical, uh, well, social skills, empathy, perspective taking, kindness, active curiosity. And these come about when the child receives the full nested support. So I'll see if I can get this to go to the next slide. Yes. So this is the Evolved Nest. And today we're going to be talking about touch to some degree. And um, we're going to talk about negative touch, actually. So we're talking about infant circumcision. So let's go to the stop sharing so we can talk about that. And thank you so much again, John, for being here. You're a retired lawyer, law professor, and you know a lot about this topic. And so perhaps you can uh, let us, you know, tell us more about your experience. What do you think parents should know about infant circumcision? What is it that they're missing, the information they're missing? Uh, what is it that uh, keeps this practice going in the United States? Well, I guess parents should first of all know that not all doctors are in favor of circumcision. Certainly my members are not. Uh, many of them are deeply disturbed by their own circumcision and wish the practice had halted. Um, I need to mention that the US is the only country in the world that still practices what we call medicalized circumcision that is distinct from the ritual and the religious types. Um, all other countries uh, have basically abandoned it. Europe, European countries never adopted it. And it became popular in the English speaking countries, which is England, Britain, United States, Australia, New Zealand, and some small pockets in the Caribbean and South Africa. But basically the practice has, is seriously dying away in Canada and Australia. Um, and it's disappeared completely in my native New Zealand in, in the 1960s and disappeared in England prior to that in the late 1940s. So really the US is kind of an outlier. I mean trying to convince American parents that their child will be just like the rest of the world is simply a, a dishonest exercise. Uh, it is not a universal practice, very much an American practice. Right, and so I think uh, parents don't really know what's wrong with it. Isn't it a good thing? Is, you know, that's what the doctors seem to imply and nurses, uh, they pressure parents now, apparently, regularly to undergo oh. this <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, procedure. And can you say more about that? Well, historically, not? you know, the, 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 all medical knowledge that people had typically came through two portals from their own family as, as kind of folkloric family stuff and from doctors whose word was pretty much, you know, accepted without question. The Internet has changed all that because now an expectant parent can look at a video of a circumcision and say, well, I'm not going to do that to my newborn. And they can question the practice. They can read articles that question the practice. And so it's really under threat. And I'm delighted to say I'm part of that effort. Um, but I think parents should know that the natural body is, is, is something that's highly evolved. I mean, we came from 100,000 years ago. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we were high maintenance or if we required uh, corrective surgery at birth. So, I mean, there's things about us that we never think about, like, we don't shampoo our eyes, for instance. Why is that? There are two gigantic holes in our head, very close to our brain. Surely they need constant cleaning. The answer is no. They're self-cleaning, self-defending. Tears have heavy proteins that, that catch invading pathogens. Uh, matter of fact, I think there was some indication a few weeks ago that wearing glasses actually protects you a bit from COVID because it protects a COVID um, protein from invading your tears and getting past your body's primary defenses. I don't know how many cases of COVID could be traced to the eyes. I assume it'd be very difficult. But uh, I mean, we don't really need to clean our ears very often. Our earwax is also similarly protective against incoming pathogens. So the human body is much less vulnerable than we think. 
and much less in need of constant cleansing than we think. Um, I, I've always felt slightly sorry for people who, for instance, bathe every day, because basically you're cleaning off your natural biome, the natural bacteria and other substances that linger on your skin. And so to that extent, you may be causing yourself all sorts of problems that you think you need to keep bathing to solve, like itching or rashes. So basically, you know, bathing three times a week ought to be pretty good. I mean, obviously, if you take a cold shower in a place that's super, super hot, like Phoenix in August, uh, that's okay. But I wouldn't use soap. I would just use water to cool off. So along your theme of touch, I have to say, one of the unexplored aspects of circumcision is not only the pain and the loss of sensation that comes from it, but also we don't even know precisely what the touch of procreation in humans provides both parties. No one has ever actually studied that. And yet there is a new study, I'm sure you're aware of it and read some of the, of the scholarship about how human touch is important. We know, for instance, that children don't thrive if they don't have touch that preemies in a hospital, premature children, are in desperate need of being touched by anyone, someone, anyone, just to help them thrive. So touch is extremely important. But the other thing it, it, people don't realize is that circumcision was invented to dampen down sexual sensation. It, and the inventors of it in the 1850s, 1860s were not shy about that. They were very keen to detune the male's sexual sensation since they viewed sexual activity as physically dangerous. In fact, there was a theory called reflex neurosis, which basically said if you touched your genitalia, you will cause yourself a disease to appear elsewhere. Uh, the neurosis part is a 19th century word for basically irritation. And reflex, of course, we understand is the reaction to that touching. So for instance, in the 1860s, the child who got tuberculosis, which was a very common and deadly 19th century disease would be accused of touching his penis. And so the solution to that was a circumcision and it was made to be painful so that the child would get a warning about how you know, deadly it was to touch his genitalia and how inappropriate it was morally to touch his genitalia. So this, this compulsion, this, this social obsession we have in the US has a very long history to it, 170 years at least. And of course it came originally from Britain and prior before that to France, though they quickly discarded it. But don't get me started, I could recite the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> and back in the early uh, millennia ago when the Jewish people started it, it was just a tiny little nick, right? And then it expanded to include more of the foreskin. So it wasn't so damaging at that time. That's correct. And the original moil, the method that the moil, the Jewish moil used was to pull the foreskin out and cut off the outer portion. And that's actually quite destructive because the outer portion of the foreskin is itself highly erogenous. But when, uh, you know, as the child healed, eventually his scar would be far enough away from the end of his penis that he had a segment of erogenous tissue left over. And I've actually cheered up very angry Jewish men who call me up and I say, you know, if you had a, a, a bris as a child, you might actually be in better shape than many of us who got an American style circumcision. That's much, much, much more destructive. Yeah. Uh, the Gomco clamp, for instance, and the Plastibel, the two communist methods are both highly destructive of erogenous tissue. And one uh, film that's really uh informative is called American Circumcision. You appear in that film, I think maybe. Yeah, and you know, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> it's been a couple of years and Hollywood hasn't called. I do not understand. Apparently I'm not as photogenic as I thought. But yeah, I had a bit part in that. I, I think it's an important film. People should check it out, especially if they're expecting a child and are you know curious about circumcision and whether it's needed or not needed. And watching uh, an actual circumcision, uh, oh, to, brutal! Uh, just, uh, just excruci excruciating. Uh, so I, I, that's probably a good idea for those who are thinking seriously about doing it. Right. I have to tell you, even 25 years of doing this work, I can't watch those videos. It's just too. I don't know. It just dampens my spirit for days. So I avoid them. I know they're out there. And, you know, I, I share them if people ask, but I can't look at them myself. 
So there are alternatives now for welcoming a Jewish boy, for example, into the community that don't yeah. require circumcision. So people can look those kinds of things up. Yeah, I work for uh, several doctors, one of whom is an observant Jew who's very unhappy about the fact that he's circumcised. He's now in his 80s, uh, named Mark Reese. He wouldn't be shy about my mentioning it. And he's very, he has popularized what's called bris shalom. Bris means covenant or promise. And shalom, of course, is the Jewish and Arabic word for peace. And uh, so it's a peace ceremony, the promise of peace. And uh, it's a wonderful ceremony, which involves um, prayers and, and, you know, naming and also cutting up a pomegranate because that's a sort of, it's an important symbolic fruit in Middle Eastern culture. And the cutting of the pomegranate basically is a symbolic version of the old actual cutting. And I, I think it's a quite wonderful ceremony. I have several books of suggested uh, um, scenarios for it. Uh, on my shelf that I've been sent. And Mark Reese, I'm, I'm very proud of him because he keeps a list of celebrants nationwide, in fact, I think even worldwide, um, who will perform a bris shalom at the request of the parents. I think it's a wonderful ceremony. Wonderful. So I, I'd like to talk about two more topics. One is why is this continuing uh, apart from cultural reasons? And then also, what are the harms that are actually done or that you can see in adult men? Well, to the first thing, let me show you, let me show you something. Um, it's called, I'm, I'm going to put it up in front of my face and closer to the camera, but circumcision is basically a meme plex. And this is a meme plex diagram. And it shows how there are so many different beliefs that are interlocking and that feed each other and sustain each other that circumcision is very hard to challenge. It touches religious issues, fear of sexuality, looking like dad, um, looking like your relatives, hygiene, um, sexuality. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different, uh, uh, would you call them individual memes that they're hard to unlock. And so it, it, it's a pernicious business. I will tell you, it was born in the 19th century from a blending of fear of incoming immigrants. Immigrants were coming from Europe in droves in the days before immigration was really uh, tightly controlled. A fear of immigrants, fear of immigrants bearing disease at a time when if you caught a disease, there was no real uh, antibiotics to save you. No understanding of germs either, right? Well, well, they sort of knew that something passed between people in close proximity. So they did understand that, you know, about, uh, say, smallpox epidemics or cholera or typhus. I mean, these diseases were understood to be around, just nobody knew what the agent was, what the operating agent was. So, I mean, germs were discovered in 1879. But even after that, even after people knew about germs, they actually became even more fearful because now there were germs everywhere. You just couldn't see them. And it was, it, we forget that it's only our era in about since the mid 1940s with the beginnings of sulfonilamide and, pen and penicillin that there was any control of disease for, uh, at all. And now of course there's a new era, different topic, but a new era of superbugs for which we have no antibiotics. And if we get them, you're in deep trouble. But I have to go back to the 19th century thing. Once again, circumcision was not invented to enhance adult sexual response or is adult sexual behavior. It was specifically intended to remove the boy's erogenous tissue to make his penis less sensitive on the theory that he wouldn't be as amused fooling with it and he wouldn't overuse it um, in, uh, in, with intercourse. So any doctor or hospital in the United States today in, 19, in 2021 who claims that, that uh, circumcision is sexually neutral is simply being stunningly dishonest, not to the obvious anatomical facts, but also to the very well-recorded history of American medical practice and the, the, the very proud inventors of circumcision for that reason. This has changed because in the 1960s with the American Cultural Revolution, a pushback against authority, a pushback against uh, sexuality uh, in a more puritanical version of sexuality that's part of Anglophone culture, um, there, there came a question as to what was happening with circumcision and how was it affecting sexuality. And of course, 
<laughs> those who were promoting it instantly switched from being very proud and bragging about its ability to control sexuality to saying, no, it was sexually neutral. And I'm old enough at 75 to remember that switchover because I specifically remember doctors being interviewed in the 1950s and 60s and articles written and published saying that, that this would help control your child's touching his genitalia because it would no longer be as attractive to him. But that became poor salesmanship. And so what happened was they switched techniques to talking about it as helpful for preventing disease and especially things that we now know like urinary tract infection, UTI, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, um, including uh, cervical cancer, and, um, and now of course, HIV AIDS. So <laughs> the history of this issue and the history of infant circumcision is a history of a rotating long list of diseases that were claimed to be prevented or cured by circumcision and the list is, it just constantly morphs. It drops off a disease like tuberculosis that no one believes is sexually transmitted anymore and pops in a disease like HIV in which, oh, it's an interesting question. Does it really? Um, and of course it, your readers may know or your, your listeners may know that we have circumcised over 26,000 sub-Saharan African men on a theory that this would protect them from HIV. But what, what they don't mention is that while it might protect men from HIV and we don't know the mechanism, it doesn't protect the woman at all because now the man can brag that he's free of HIV and can't possibly transmit it. And he might say that to a vulnerable woman who's not in a good position to say no. So my position um, is that this has endangered women in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my organization has pushed back against PEPFAR the Gates Foundation and WHO in, in Switzerland and other organizations that have promoted circumcision as an HIV preventative. I have to say to modern parents who say, well, maybe we should get our child circumcised to prevent HIV. And I'm thinking, so you think your child is, you think this baby who's 48 hours old is going to be practicing unsafe sex, perhaps unsafe sex with another man and you need to circumcise him in order to prevent that? And there are no other methods? Um, so you can see, uh, Darsha, there's an awful lot of odd beliefs floating around about circumcision and its ability to protect against disease. And I know that uh, people say, what is there a 1% chance of something? I, uh, well, uh, you're yeah. talking about the UTI risk? Yes, yeah, the UTI. But if you compare it to girls' risk of breast cancer, that's 12% or something like that. So <laughs> exactly. You actually cut the girls' breasts out to prevent breast cancer. It's like, what? That blows your mind yeah. thinking that it's a similar kind of thing. Happening. No, I'm doing yeah, the 1% stat is the invention of a physician in the 80s, 1980s, uh, who worked for the army. And he observed that boys uh, who were not circumcised had more troubles with UTI. And he put it at 1%. Well, two things about that. One is we now know that those boys typically had a congenital anomaly, like incompetent descending ureters from the kidney to the bladder. And so in a sense, they're getting a UTI it was diagnostic of, of, of the problem they have, rather than just being a problem that uncircumcised or we like to call them intact boys have. That so that's been, problem. Pretty, yeah. it, that's been pretty thoroughly debunked, uh, but it is a very strong meme that still floats around. I mean, you still hear the UTI thing. I was on national public radio a couple of years debating a pediatrician who was constantly hammering on about UTI. Um, <laughs> and frankly, he was just mouthing stuff he'd heard I mean, the scholarship wasn't there. Even if one in a hundred boys has, gets a UTI, it can A, be managed with antibiotics. And secondly, um, would 99 men really want to be free of their erogenous tissue in order to save one boy from a two week problem with his urinary tract? I rather doubt it. So it, it's an example of you know the problem of number needed to treat. How many people do you need to treat in order to prevent what? And so the, the, the UTI thing is just ridiculous to me. I just find it offensive. So maybe we should talk about then what are the effects on men in particular? You could also talk about boys, but uh, what are the long-term effects here? So people say, well, oh, so what? What is well, can I, so what? Yeah. Can I give an infomercial for the natural organ itself? I mean, especially as you're, you're, you're 
working metaphor here is, is about touch and the need for touch. The, the human organ um, at birth is rather ingeniously designed, if you think about it. It has a, an outer pucker that can easily be seen in photos of babies, of, of newborn babies. An outer pucker that's basically a one-way valve. It works very much like our mouth or our anus or other one-way valves in our body, like the one at the bottom of your stomach that keeps contents moving, et cetera. There are various of these circumferential muscular structures in the human body. So in other words, the first thing is it's protective of the organ getting any kind of pathogens in the urinary tract itself. So once again, to our urinary tract theme, that one-way valve is extremely helpful. When the boy is born, the foreskin is also bound by a layer of tissue uh, to the glands, to the underlying glands, and that tissue takes 10 years to go away. A little boy can't see the end of his penis yet, uh, and he doesn't have any need to. He doesn't have any need to clean it or see it or worry about it, as long as he can pee a stream is all he needs. So there's number two in the way of ingenious designs. The other thing is that the boy's erogenous tissue is folded face down. So it's not subject to abrasion or infection or pathogens or even unwanted sexual, um, what would you call it, touching because it's packed away. Only upon erection does that tissue appear and that's at a time when it's useful. Unfortunately, what circumcision does is it, it does away with the one-way valve that protects pathogens from getting into the, ure the urethra and the bladder. It does away with the natural membrane. In fact, that's the first step of a circumcision is the painful removal of that membrane. It's, that's when the child really screams. Um, and also it, it gets rid of the, the circumcision ablates, as we say in medicine, ablates that erogenous tissue, leaving just a fragment of it behind. And basically pulling into use for intercourse tissue that's part of the lower abdomen that is not well supplied with nerves. Uh, a circumcised man who wishes to do so, and this is a melancholy exercise, can notice that his actual sexual sensation tissue, his erogenous tissue, ends precisely at his scar line abruptly. And the tissue after that is basically no more sensitive than the lower abdomen itself. So there are a lot of losses there. Um, I counsel men all the time who figure this out and are very, very unhappy. I mean, partly we all know that, you know, your sexual confidence has something to do with how you are as a lover and a husband. Um, and so the notion that you have been demeaned is not actually good for, you know, males, the male's performance. It's, it's understandably a real dampener to even think about that. So quite frankly, the work I've been doing for 25 years, I do not count on circumcised men as allies. They are often in deep denial. They are often very, very wary of encountering any information that they might be less than whole. So my, my, oddly enough, my best allies are intact men who know what they have and gay men who, as I joke, have done the field research. And uh, I mean, and they're happy to hear that. So a lot of DOCS members and supporters are, are gay men and we welcome their viewpoints and their, uh, and their humane view of, of this particular topic. But yeah, the losses are substantial and they're inarguable. And I just hate going to the University of Washington Medical Library where I'm, I'm frequently found and reading in urology texts that the male's glands, the little fireman's hat, the little mushroom end of the penis is the sensitive part because it is not. It is very dull, probably more like an earlobe, um, has scattered, that is protopathic nerve endings that aren't bundled or dedicated. It can barely detect light touch and it can barely uh, distinguish between hot and cold. Uh, and that seems very odd. It is reasonably sensitive at its corona, the widest part, um, but it, it, it seems like nature designed it as more of a pillow to protect both parties in, in human reproduction. And it, it has very little in the way of sensitivity. Now contrast that to women whose, cl whose clitoris, I'm told, is sensitive all over, both at the end, at the cover, and at the crus, the legs that, that uh, that extend downward. Uh, but to that extent, the male and female are quite different. So I, I you know, I'm rambling on and, and I think I may have stepped over your your initial question, Darsha. I think uh, 
we probably should uh, wrap it up, but can you say something about the profits? Uh, usually things that are happening because if you follow the money, there's somebody making money off of this. Is well, that, yeah, and a, rec a recent study by an allied organization of ours, Intact America in New York, found out that the average number of times that, a, that parents were importuned, that is begged to allow their boy to be circumcised is eight. Eight times, that's a remarkable number of times to come up with the same question. And our organization considers that basically almost, uh, you know, abusive to, to be doing, yeah, to be doing that to uh, parents who are tired, you know, stressed out, the mother's trying to burn off some of her pain meds if she had them. And, you know, childbirth is a, is a tiring business. And even the father who hasn't endured the pain is probably sleep deprived. So importuning people eight times to get them to circumcise their child sends a very odd message for me. It, it just says, why don't you leave these people alone? Why is it so necessary to market that? It's not even that lucrative a practice. It's, you know, a thousand dollars, but I mean, a thousand dollars in the medical world is coffee money. So I have not yet reconciled to myself in the 30 years I've been thinking about this, why hospitals are so aggressive about promoting circumcision and so um, almost compulsive about it. It's, it's very odd. Nurses can get fired for saying the truth about circumcision, about talking about the pain and the bleeding and the, bot, the occasional botch. Um, residents can be dismissed from their residency program because they want to be a conscientious objector to the practice. I counsel those uh, residents on a regular basis. So it's very strange to me. And uh, as you might know, the tissue is, is culled and used for creating uh, cosmetics. And so there's an industry that benefits from the tissue as well. Uh, the whole thing is unfortunately sorted in its social history, it's sorted in its medical history, it's sorted in, in bioethics. I do not understand how circumcision could ever pass a true test of bioethics. So you, you can see my struggle. Yes. Maybe one By the way, I have, uh, huh. I have a brochure that, that parents can ask me for about foreskin care. And if you want to know how a boy is cared, can be cared for easily, the, the brochure could be very small because all you have to know is there's nothing to do. Leave it alone. It will be just fine. But people are frightened by doctors who tell them that they're going to have to be constantly pulling back the foreskin, which is an injury, and cleaning underneath, which is unnecessary. Mm. By the way, just a second, one more tiny little infomercial. This is a picture of a boy who was forcibly retracted at a well baby visit. I've handled 1,500 cases like that of parents who call me and say, you know, we're calling from the ER, our child was forcibly retracted at a well baby visit, and now he's swelling and bleeding and we don't know what to do. So th th that's another little myth. It's another, I call it the doppelganger of, of circumcision. It's the evil twin of circumcision. Injuring the child by saying that the natural membrane he has is a birth defect that needs to be destroyed. It's a terrible thing, and I estimate its incidence, my physicians estimate its incidence at over 100,000 cases a year. Yeah, and not stopping. And the problem is that as circumcision drops in popularity, especially on the west coast of the U.S., um, there's a richer, target-rich cohort of boys who are now intact and who are at risk of having their foreskin forcibly retracted. So another sad business. We, we, you wrote uh, at Psychology Today at my blog, Moral Landscapes, we have several um, articles on circumcision and one of them is beware of the, the well baby visit. <laughs> exactly. And, and I have to thank you here in public for your willingness to publish those articles, which you can appreciate were probably pretty unpopular in the, in the more common medical press um, as being basically embarrassing. Yeah. And unfortunately now psychology today will not allow any mention of infant circumcision. So yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I wonder who got to them. Yeah, I know. So uh, anyway, I, I appreciate your time, John. Is there any last thing that you would like to say? Maybe uh, where should people go for more information perhaps? Well, 
Well, I mean, I, I guess I have to put in a plug for doctors opposing circumcision. We have what I think is one of the most honest and even balanced websites on the topic. I mean, we're very candid about what can be done, how natural a boy is, how easy he is to, to clean, um, how happy he will be when he's older to have a full intact body and reasons parents should give this uh, a, a, careful, a careful thought. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of hyperbole in it. My doctors made sure that didn't happen. Uh, we made sure it was evenly balanced and discussed all the diseases that people claim circumcision can solve. And I, I think it, in, that we've done an excellent job. I can also recommend Your Whole Baby, who do a terrific job. Uh, it's a website. They maintain a list of foreskin-friendly providers. I can also recommend Intact America, Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, Nurses for the Rights of the Child. I mean, there are quite a few organizations encouraging people to consider the natural body as worthy of respect and our long evolution as worthy of respect. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John, for your leadership here and your ongoing efforts to ensure that every child has a full kind of uh, way to be themselves without damage. Thanks, Darsha. Parents have nothing to lose by leaving their children natural. Thank you so much.